<laughs> so, I was thinking, you, you, you saw the videos that we did before the election. Yes. As much as we could, but, but you were very magnanimous since then. What's your attitude now? Oh, well, my attitude is that there's a lot of work to do. Uh, we have a, a massive state budget deficit we got to fix. Uh, we've got a lot of liberals that need to be removed from office. Um, and uh, that takes a lot of work. It takes more than just showing up at a rally or grumbling about something or writing a, an op-ed piece. There's actually work that needs to be done to change these electoral outcomes. Now, what's happening in the state now? They're rolling back the state salaries to a federal minimum wage? Right. Well, that, that is a, um, a thing that the governor is trying to do to preserve cash and to kind of increase the pressure on the legislature to come up with a budget. Uh, there is some uh, discussion as to whether or not that's legal, uh, and it may be undone, but um, it's certainly something the governor is trying to do as a way to preserve cash. On national security, are you backing away off that issue? Because obviously that, that's been a strong point of yours. Oh, I'm not backing away at all. I had a very strongly worded commentary a couple of days ago about how disappointed I was that the President of the United States said he wasn't happy when the FBI did its job and arrested those 11 deep cover Russian agents. Uh, when a president says he's not happy about the timing of the arrest, as if it's all about him, as if it's all about the fact that he just recently had a meeting with Russian uh, uh, President Medvedev, and somehow that this embarrassed him that, uh, that the FBI arrested 11 deep cover agents because they were worried about them uh, having a flight risk. And in fact, as we saw, their paymaster uh, escaped out through Cyprus. They arrested him in Cyprus. Then the uh, the corrupt Cyprus government let him out on bail, and he disappeared. So he's probably back in Moscow already. So, did you see any similarities between President Obama's uh, attitude and the president of uh, the CEO of BP, who felt that he was inconvenienced by the problems the country, uh, the crises? Well, uh, I, I certainly think that there might be some um, some commonality there, uh, except for the fact that uh, in the case of the President of the United States, every four years we have an election. In the case of the, uh, the head of BP, at any moment his board of directors could remove him. So uh, at least the, in both cases you have accountability uh, where both individuals uh, have to answer on a periodic basis to people who may think that they uh, need to do a better job. I have one question. On the BP oil spill, what does it mean that there was 13 countries ready to help and step in and there was some federal law that prevented it? Yeah, there's a federal law that's been on the books for over 100 years that prevents uh, foreign flag vessels from doing tasks within American waters that American flag vessels could do. Uh, and uh, it's a, a protectionist piece of legislation. The president could have waived it and could have allowed uh, all of these uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, flag vessels that had uh, sophisticated skimming equipment to come in and to help prevent our beaches from being fouled, but he didn't waive uh, the act. Why not? Uh, well, the, there's a lot of pressure from uh, the unions, the maritime unions, to not allow these foreign flag vessels to come in. So uh, I, I think it's uh, just a, a political pressure uh, uh, move that he responded to. And it seems like a travesty, but uh, Jendel is the governor and a likely presidential candidate or opponent against him. Could you see politics at play with this? Well, if there's not politics in play, then there certainly was the lack of willingness to cut through the Washington bureaucracy and the red tape. When a governor of a state says he needs to build berms to protect sensitive marshland areas, and you allow that decision to languish with the Army Corps of Engineers and the Federal Environmental Protection Agency as they go through innumerable paperwork drills to figure out whether or not to let a governor build these berms to protect his own marshland, that could have been solved with one presidential phone call. And the president didn't do that. He didn't take charge. He didn't take over as commander-in-chief, as chief executive officer of the executive branch of the United States of America. And so if there wasn't politics involved, then there certainly was a degree of lackadaisical incompetence. Shouldn't the state and the governor just have stepped in and done it on their own, even if they face fines and, and arrest? 
Well, they, they certainly could have, but then you run into the issue of rule of law within a constitutional republic. Uh, you know, had he have done that, uh, and was willfully doing it, uh, there's a chance that he could have been individually liable because he was doing something that stood, that basically went outside the bounds of legal propriety. A governor, as long as they're following the rules, can't be held legally personally liable. But if he uh, was seen to be doing things that he knew might be illegal, then he could have been personally liable, and, and that's one of the reasons why he probably didn't step in and, and, and do that. What if federal law, Trump, uh, this federal law they say trumps state law under the 14th Amendment, but how do you understand that in a state of emergency that the state can't protect itself and has to wait for the federal government, which takes forever, it seems? Well, I think that perhaps the, the problem was they asked the, the preferred permission. If they, I guess if they had just started doing it and then were told to stop, that would have been a different issue. Well, they probably would have faced a lot of controversy and they would have to back down over that order to stop. Either way. Do you have any uh, uh, opinions about the recent disclosure that the U.S. and Israeli troops have been uh, depositing uh, uh, military equipment in Azerbaijan and Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, posing a threat to Iran? Uh, it, it's not surprising. Uh, the threat from Iran threatens to destabilize the entire Gulf region, uh, not just a threat against Israel, but a threat to all of Iran's uh, non uh, Shia neighbors, uh, non-Arab neighbors, uh, which is the entire region. And so uh, it, it's not surprising to me that certain regimes that publicly would not uh, want to admit to this or would be publicly not very friendly with Israel or even America would take quiet moves to uh, secure their national interests from the Iranian threat. Yeah, but uh, with Mo uh, Admiral Mullen in Israel this week uh, and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu coming to Washington next week. Do you think the White House will support the Pentagon uh, to, to pose a, a more than just a, a visible threat? Well, I certainly hope they do, because what's happening with the Islamic Republic of Iran right now is we have a ticking time bomb. Every day that goes by is one more day closer to a viable uh, militarization of nuclear weapons in that country. Uh, they've been working very diligently to weaponize their, their nuclear capacity and to perfect their missiles to deliver those uh, nuclear weapons. And so uh, I'm afraid that if we wait until they do an underground test of a nuclear weapon, uh, it may be too late. And uh, the question is, can a regime composed uh, of uh, basically a theocratic regime with millennial aspirations, can they be deterred like a traditional secular regime be deterred? A, a regime run by people who are quite aware of their own individual mortality, uh, as in the case of uh, North Korea, for example. Uh, the, the, the Islamic Republic of Iran, or at least its leadership, may be the first such regime in the history of mankind where the uh, regime at the top may actually look favorably upon mass martyrdom. One final question. Uh, the uh, San Diego uh, Department of Homeland Security yesterday uh, withdrew their prosecution of Mossab Hussein Yosef, the son of Hamas, on, uh, on a directive from above, as they said. But, but the prosecution, they, uh, they said, also came as a directive from above three weeks after Arif Ali Khan took, assumed the uh, position of Assistant Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. You, you supposed, and, and he was formerly the uh, Deputy Mayor in Los Angeles, I mean he rose from a, a, a reasonably uh, bureaucratic position to sudden a deputy mayor ship and now Department of Homeland Security ship and, and then this uh, uh, obstreperous prosecution of someone who was obviously as an apostate a risk to uh, to, to his uh, uh, being deported and yet they prosecuted. Uh, what is your concern about what's happening in the Department of Homeland Security? Well I think you see it not just in the Department of Homeland Security but also with our Justice Department and other branches of the government right now 
where you have uh, Chicago-style politics uh, playing an ever greater role in directing people to do things or not to do things uh, based on the political calculus for the White House. Uh, so whether or not this was a payback for somebody, whether there is even any connection, uh, I don't know. I think that may be difficult to know until uh, some emails have been uncovered or some internal correspondence that somebody might get through the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, right now we just have uh, vague connections and coincidences and whether in fact that uh, has led to something in particular. What I do see though is that there is a pattern with this White House of uh, politicizing more things that have been politicized in recent White Houses. And when you deal with the flotilla incident, I was